on YouTube and I just started iTunes. So you can find me at either place. The name of my show is Crypto PTSD. That's C R Y P T O and then PTSD, like post traumatic stress disorder. Thank you very much. And I'll make sure to link that for everybody so they can check that out. So this happened in Missouri. And I know that one of your first encounters was kind of a basically a road sighting, like the classic road sighting. And I mean, how old were you when that happened? What year did that happen? And let's uh, let's dive right into some of these Bigfoot encounters. Okay. Well, that happened in 2014. Um, and you want me to go ahead and just talk about the encounter then? Yeah. Like, uh, let's talk about the property. You know, uh, how long did you live there? Is it, is it a friend? Is it a family? Just so that everybody gets the, the broad stroke background on the, on the actual property. Okay. So this happened in 2014. It's my stepdad's property. I, at 18 years old, moved out of the house. Uh, I lived on my own for uh, three or four years or had roommates and then ended up moving back in with my mom, which which sucked at the time. Uh, If anybody else has had to do it, they know what I'm talking about. And I lived there for a couple of years before I ended up getting a, a, a new job and moving to St. Louis. But the the property that all this happened on, my step dad has lived on his entire life so i believe his grandfather owned it and it's been passed down and passed down and passed down and they they raise cattle on it and that, that that's basically it they're a family of mechanics but moved in there and when when the first thing we noticed so this this took a while for things to get put together I had this siding. I, I was coming home one night, coming down the driveway. The driveway is shaped like a J. And I would always hang to the side of the road to look down the pathway that goes into the east field. And this night was just like every night. I was doing the same thing. I even wore a spot out on the grass on the side of the road uh, because I did it every night. I'd come home late and sometimes there'd be deer or different animals down there that I, I would stop and look at and then you know, go and park my truck. I'm a big hunter, and so I enjoy just watching wildlife. This night, I saw something run across the path, so not on the road I was on, but on the path that kind of continues to go straight and then curves to the east field. Something ran across, and it was, I thought it was a deer. That was my first thought. It was thicker than a deer. Uh, it looked odd, and I saw a glint of eye shine whenever it shot across. So, you know, I'm coming to a stop, and to the right of the path, there's a tree, and there's a old semi-trailer. Like I said, my, my stepdad, he, he drives a truck, but he's, he's a mechanic. He loves cars, so he's got um, some some vehicles back there, but... I saw something glinting on the right side. And at first, the first thought that came in my head was the tape on the back of the semi-trailer. Some semi-trailers have reflective tape Mm -hmm. on the corners. And I thought that maybe it came loose and it it was flapping in the wind. But I knew that was wrong. That was just the first thing that popped in my head. What I saw were were two eyes. Um, They were probably seven to eight inches. And they were shaped a lot like hen's eggs. And this thing is moving, it, and it's it's looking at me, and it's looking across the path, and it's ducking and standing and kind of bobbing as it does it. And it, it's it's hard to explain. It's very jerky and very fluid. It, it didn't look natural. And the, this whole thing happened, lasted about seven seconds. At the end of the seven seconds, it was about midway in, in its stance, and it stands straight up, and when it did, it squared up to my truck. It, whenever it squared up to my truck, it I saw the outline of it. I saw the head, the arms, um, and this thing was massive. It, 
it squared up to the truck and as soon as it got up to full stance and i don't know why it did this but it it shrunk whoop went down and it went down below the grass line mm. and i i couldn't see it anymore it didn't go left across the path because i would have seen it it had to have gone to the right um it was massive how tall do you think the grass was Mm, so there, there's a couple of pallets or a few pallets stacked right there. I don't know if it was on it or on the ground. Uh, the grass there is kind of grown through the pallets, but probably three and a half foot. And this thing, as tall as it was, you said it was like nine to ten feet tall. It shrunk down that much to where you couldn't see it, and it it went off. It was gone. And it was fluid, oh. like if. If I'm going to shrink down like it did, I'm going to get to where basically my stomach touches my knees and then I'm going to have to put my legs behind me and my hands down. Like there's going to be a stop in, in the motion. Oh, sorry. My hands are shaking. That's um, okay. So and, uh, it looked extremely odd the way that it ducked down. It looked very unnatural. Yes. It, it it was just completely fluid and there was no stop. There was no movement. It just went straight down and it was the same pace the whole way down. And I, I, I didn't see it again. Now, when I was looking at it, the, the head was massive. The head didn't look small. It looked proportional. Mm -hmm. Uh, the head was not coned. I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't say any more cone than what my head is. Right. Like it, it was, it was more rounded, which is not consistent with what, what I hear. Um, and, and the shoulders were huge. The muscle where you get a shot in your arm. So if you take your hand and put it on your arm where you would get a flu shot, that muscle right there was like a basketball. It was mm. perfectly round the, and it uh, was abnormal looking the the back of the arms of the tricep the meaty part the like if i i don't know what what it's called here but if you get a shot in in the top of your arm like on the high side of your arm it's it's right there like if if you were a police officer where their their patches on the sleeve on the top like where people put patches, oh the, the deltoid sense? like the top of the shoulder yeah well it if you put your hand on your neck and you slide it down to where it's on your shoulder mm -hmm. and you go all the way out to where your hand now slides down on your arm, that muscle right there. Okay. So that thing was was abnormally large, huh? So that stuck that, right out in your the mind. Shape, yeah, it it was the shape of it. You know, if you look at a at a guy who's well built, it it's bigger and it sticks out, but it's not mm -hmm. perfectly round. Right. You know, it's round at the top and then it kind of flattens out and then it kind of curves back into the body. This thing, it was like the only time I've ever seen it before, some uh, huge bodybuilder that's on steroids. Mm -hmm. And it's so round, it looks abnormal. It does not, it looks like it's been filled with water or something. And it was and both it, sides. It's like this, it. it wasn't like it had some sort of a growth or something. It was both sides equal. It was both sides. Now, Ooh. the right side of its body was against the tree, but I could see the outline of it. Mm -hmm. You already said the eyes were seven to eight inches apart, right? And did you say, yeah. did you already say for everybody how wide, though? You said how tall he was. But how wide was he, do you think? Probably right around four foot. I mean, it was, mm. he was at least half the width of my pickup truck. Oh my God. And it was an 89 GMC, it was just the old clunker that I, I drove around back then. Um, it, it, it literally felt like he could flip my truck. Right. Like it, it, seeing something, it's hard to describe what it's like to see something that big. Um, it, it's, I, I don't know. It was, uh, so <laughs> after looking at it, I pulled up. I, I have no idea. I remember the fear of not wanting to get out of the truck to walk inside the house because I mean, it, it's literally within a hundred yards of the door. Like it's probably mm. like, 50 yards from the door I got to walk in 
and our, our driveway is like a quarter of a mile long. It, it's a, it's a long driveway. And after that, I, I don't know. I know this is going to be hard for some people to swallow, but I, I didn't think about it. I thought I saw a monster. That was it. And until things continued to happen, I, we thought that it was something else. I never thought it was this. To be honest, I don't remember ever thinking about it again until later when another event happened and everything came rushing back and finally all this stuff made sense to me. So I don't know if I just, I don't know. I, I didn't think about it. I tucked it away and it was not on my on my mind ever until much later. So do you think that's just a defense mechanism since you did like the outdoors so much, you like to hunt, and obviously you live on this property with your family, <clears throat> so do you think that was just a defense? Just to forget about uh, it, I mean. I probably, I used to think, you know, like people who, which I was very arrogant and probably my, my girlfriend could, would still say I'm arrogant, but, uh, I used to think that if somebody said, oh, I had a memory that I blocked out as a kid, like, I thought that was like an easy a scapegoat. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a, you know, I thought it was bull crap. And I'm not saying that that's what happened, but that's the only thing I can think. I, I don't know how to explain it other than that. I don't know why the next morning I didn't think about it. I don't know when I got out of the vehicle and went inside. I don't know if I cried. I don't know if I jumped in the shower, went to bed. I don't know if I sat there and stared. I don't know. I, that's the only thing I can think that, that it was is maybe I just, I, I know I thought I saw a monster. I never thought it was a Bigfoot. I never thought it was anything like that. I didn't think it was an ape or a monkey that had escaped. I thought it was a monster, and that was kind of it. Mm. Now, what about, you say you don't really remember exactly what you did after that, which I, I don't blame you. I can understand that. Do you, at this point, are you talking to your stepdad or your mom or anybody? No. Do you remember mentioning anything? Okay. No, I never never said anything until um, an event happened later that, uh, that I, I, guess, I guess I couldn't keep it tucked away in that corner anymore. <clears throat> And and now we had strange events happen after this, and we still never thought, I never thought that it could have been the thing that I saw at the end of the driveway. Hmm. Like, it, it, it's crazy. I don't know how to describe it. I was, it sounds stupid, <laughs> and it is, because it took us so long to figure out what was going on there. So what was the next thing then? for you Dustin or for the whole family what were you guys experiencing so these next few things are probably out of order but they are in between my sighting and the deer hunt those are kind of like the big things mm -hmm. because in that time we're not thinking this is Bigfoot we're thinking this is somebody coming up to the property because of the things that were going on but they were so odd that we, we couldn't understand who or why <clears throat> um, the house would get banged at night sometimes something would slap the house but it was always the garage or every time I heard it it was always the garage and the garage is well, separate mom... from the house? <clears throat> no so the house is kind of shaped like if a rectangle with a square on the right side in the middle okay. like I don't know how to describe the shape mm -hmm. like if you take three blocks and lay them down and you take another block and put it on that middle block. That's the shape of the house. Okay. And the, the garage, we don't use the front door, or the back door. There's really, there is a front door, but it's, I don't think it's ever even been opened because we go through the garage because that's where our driveway comes up to. So you walk through the garage and you go into the kitchen and now you're into the house. So it, it's connected, but there's two, uh, two doors to get into the house. The house is shaped like an L, and the garage is, is attached at the bottom. But, yeah, right. I, and my, my mom, when she would hear the, the loud bangs at night, she seemed to think it was always on that same side of the house, but she could never pin down where it was. I heard it one time standing in the kitchen, 
and it, it was very clearly in the garage. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit more about who you thought was coming up to the property because at the time you think it's a who you don't you nobody thought it was a what so things were getting hit on the house uh this isn't something until i noticed way later but there was actually rocks up on the roof which Mm -hmm. i always thought well it's my stepbrother's kids doing that which it, it very well could be but one night i'm i'm laying there with my nephew and where he used to sleep in the bed with me all the time. And he, <clears throat> the, the head of the bed is touching the outside wall. There's a window. If I'm laying on the bed and I'm looking straight up at the ceiling, directly to the right of the bed, there's a window. Well, the room to the left was my stepbrother's old room. He had a cat. Uh, he ended up moving in with his girlfriend and then they, they got married. But he had a cat that was still at the house. I'm allergic, my nephew's allergic, my mom's allergic. So the cat at night, I mean, it it stayed in that back room. And my mom would always keep the window open with a fan going. You know, this is out in the country, so which I hated because if someone wanted to break in, I mean, they, they, they could break in right there. But So I would always go in there and shut it. Well, my mom would get mad, and every day, I mean, she would go in, open it, put the fan back. So... I, I, there was a week where I was waking up every night and it's not unusual for me to wake up, but when I wake up, I'm like groggy. I just kind of roll over, go back to sleep. If I hear a noise, I'm like, Oh, it's the house creaking. Go back to sleep. What's unusual is for me to wake up and be wide awake. And this, this was happening every night. So the first night I wake up and the cat is meowing in the other room Mm. and this cat would meow for like an hour straight like i i hated this cat (laughs) so the first night i think it's the cat so the second night same thing happens except i hear the cat scurry and the wall that that joins my room and that room there's a bookshelf and there's a little space behind the bookshelf and the cat was running behind the bookshelf and meowing back there. Mm. And that's literally right on the other side of the wall from where the bed is. And so it, so it's loud. And it, I mean, it was making me mad. The third night I wake up and again, just like the previous nights I'd wake up and it, it was always silent. And then I would hear the cat scurry and run behind that bookshelf so i started thinking it was like the second night or third night i'm like what is making that cat do that like what what is going on so i'm laying there and i'm trying to figure out it's dead silent the cat hasn't made a noise i'm trying to figure out what's what's going on because i'm waking up and i'm wide awake i'm alert and i don't know what's waking me up so i hear a little pop noise and then the cat scurries through the room you know it's knocking crap over runs behind the bookshelf and starts meowing this happens again the next night and i don't remember if it was four nights in a row or five nights in a row but i the night before the last night i had caught on okay there's a little pop and then the cat so Mm. the next night same thing i wake up i there's no movement no sound i hear just a little pop and then the cat takes off and runs back there. So the pop, when the house shifts, when you hear a pop and there's weight associated with it, it's Mm -hmm. like a muffled pop. Whenever there's no weight, it's more like the, almost like a light click, you know, um, like if you were to flick the siding of a house, just Mm -hmm. lightly flick it with your nail. So I'm laying there and I'm wide awake. And, you know, this whole chain of events, I know it's coming and it happens. And I'm looking straight up because I'm, I'm kind of zoning out with my eyes because I'm using my ears. You know how at night you kind of look with your peripheral vision and, and you listen. And something on the other side of the wall, directly, not outside the window, directly on the other side of the wall from where my head was laying, I stuck my hands up like I'm reaching for the ceiling. That's about how high it was. Something spoke outside of my window. And it's, it was 
so deep that the the hallway door was open. It I could hear it bounce off the hallway wall like it shook it. Like it it was so deep and it just said a short little phrase and it, it sounded like English, but the short phrase it was saying, it sounded like it was exclaiming. Mm. You know, like if somebody was about to do something, I'm like, no, don't do that. You know, that's that's kind of what it sounded like. And my first fear was somebody being in the house. And so I jumped out of bed and I grabbed my cell phone. And I, again, I knew the sound came from the other side of the wall. But my first fear in that moment was somebody had broken into the house and they were in the house. Right. And so I wanted to make sure that that wasn't it before we ran outside. So I jump up and I call my my mom and it's like 12, 1, I don't know. It was late at night and I'm like, oh, she's not going to pick up. So my mom picks up on the third ring and she's like, what's wrong? I'm like, mom, get my stepdad up. They're inside the house. And she's like, who? I'm like, I don't know. Tell him to get his gun. They're inside the house. So she hangs up and I hear my stepdad jump out of bed Mm. and get his gun. And I'm standing at the doorway at this moment. And he comes to the door. And I think I also said, I'm going to be at the doorway. Tell him not to shoot me. Right. Um, I stand at the doorway. I hear him get to the doorway. And I'm like, hey. And I say his name. He's like, where are they? I'm like, I don't know. But look, look. don't shoot me. Let's go. So he's literally in his whitey tighties <laughs> with a pistol. I'm in my sleeping clothes. and mm-hmm. I, I may have even been in my underwear. I don't remember. But I knew they weren't inside. We flipped on the light and he's like, where are they? I'm like, I think they're outside. And I knew that, but I wanted to make sure. So we, we end up, he goes to go get a light. Well, I wanted to catch these guys. So I run outside and there's nothing. There's no one. We all end up, my mom gets my nephew. We get in the car and we drive around the property because for somebody to come on this property, they are driveways long. To come all the way down to the end of that driveway, that means you're coming to our house. Like there's no other excuse for anyone else to be down there. And to get out here, you either have to drive down or park on the gravel road and walk through the woods and so we drive all around the property we're looking for four-wheelers we're looking for atv tracks we're looking in the tall grass to see if somebody's run through it we went on the road no cars were on the road there was nothing it was an absolute mystery no one was there and that was the first time that had happened and and we thought it was because they asked me you know what happened so I told him everything, and I thought it was a drunk guy because it sounded like English, except that I couldn't make out what he said, mm-hmm. and a large drunk guy because its voice was so deep that it rattled in the hallway, and from the point where it stood outside, it had to have been big because there's at that point of the house, the footings. The concrete is like, it's like two foot tall at least. And then you've got the floor to the bed. And then the length of my arms up was about where the face was. Mm. And there's a bush right there. Whatever it was had to have been standing in between the bush and the house. Now, what about, so after all this goes on with this quote unquote large drunk man, and I mean, your, your stepdad's up, you guys are armed, you're looking you know, for, for possibly people. But when you started to give him all these little details about how high up and this weird phrase that it said and how deep its voice was, he's lived there his whole life. And so as his family, is he going, Oh my God, not this again. Or is he just still completely flummoxed? No, he's thinking someone's coming out here to steal because he's, like I said, he's a mechanic. I mean, he actually drives a truck, but Mm -hmm. that's like his, his passion. He has a um, 72 that he goes and takes the shows and he's got a real nice car, but he's got vehicles in the back and it's not like just a junkyard. Like he actually uses the parts of those vehicles. So he thinks someone's coming out on the property to steal 
the scrap or um, not the muffler, but the uh, it's got titanium in it or platinum. I, I don't remember. It's on your car. It's worth a lot of money. The Cadillac converter. He's thinking somebody's stealing, you know, Cadillac converters or something. But the thing we didn't understand or I didn't understand as well as them is that why would someone come out, sneak up to our place at night, not steal anything, and talk outside directly on the other side of the wall from me? Right. Why would someone do that? And so we're thinking, oh, there's a drunk guy and he's coming in around and he's messing around, which I don't know if you know much about Missouri, but you're going to get shot. You go on somebody's <laughs> property right. in the country at night, uh-huh. they're coming out with guns. And like, amen for it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's not like in, in a city where you can knock on someone's door and run away and they see you. It's like, oh, so much fun. You know, it's that would be very dangerous for someone to do at night. So it, it didn't make sense. Do you think that it was with the window being open for the cat? Do you think initially it was there just to screw with the cat? I think absolutely. That's that's why I mentioned it in the beginning because that room stunk. I mean, that mm-hmm. cat, it was, I mean, he eventually came and got the cat, but it, it lived there for like a year and it spent most of its time in that room. And so, it, I mean, it, it, stunk in there or i think it stunk and obviously my mom did and we're all allergic mm-hmm. to it so right she had the screen on the window so i think that these things were coming up and that cat would either see them or hear them now i don't know if they were throwing something against the house like a little rock to see if anybody was up and then coming up but the chain of events that i caught on to was the little pop then the cat would run behind that bookshelf and start meowing. And that happened those same, the first two nights, I believe that the pop happened. I just don't think I caught on to it right. because it, it was such a light little pop, but I eventually caught on to that. And then that's what made the cat run. Do you think so that yeah, it, it was I, like I, um, a, a rock or a fingernail flip? Or do you think that maybe it was using its mouth to make the pop? I've heard people say that they, you know, they can do some pretty, incredible sounds just with their their mouth i think it was either throwing a pebble against the house or flicking it but i could be wrong uh oh, you, so like, you did find some pebbles maybe that didn't really belong out there well on the other side of the house okay so this is on the west side of the house the west side of the house is flat it runs straight all the way from the garage to that back bedroom where the cat is. The east side of the house has the living room right in the middle. So it's got a block. So if that makes sense, Mm -hmm. that same shape I told you about, if you turn it to where the flat side is on the left side and then the side with the little block in the middle is on the right, on the back right corner of the garage in the living room, Right there, there was rocks from the the driveway, and there was a bunch of them up there on the roof. Mm. But that was not, I was hearing it on, it sounded like on either the wall or the roof of that room. Really, it sounded like it was on the wall. But, or, I never saw any any stones on that side of the house or on the ground. Uh, that night, we actually shined lights right outside of the house, because I'm like, there's something standing here. I'm not the best tracker, but I've done it for hunting. So I'm, you know, if something just runs through something, I have a good chance of seeing it. And I didn't even see where anything was standing on Mm. the grass. How close are the woods right there, Dustin, by your window and then the cat's window? So the east side of the house, we have the yard, the driveway, and then that's the start of a hauler. It starts going downhill and... On that side, they're probably 70 yards, but there's trees in the field that have grown up, and I'm not counting that. There's mm-hmm. thick cover within 30 yards, um, but the, the wood line is kind of cut out because they, they used to have cattle over there, which they don't anymore. And then the east side of the house and north side of the house is the east pasture. It, it's, it's probably 300 yards across the field. 
there's a little pond, and then there's another patch of woods over there. But if you stand at the beginning of our driveway and you look, you can see our house, and then everything behind our house for as far as your eye can see is just hollers and woods. Um, did you guys have any uh, cattle on the property at all or any, any not, other livestock? Not at that time. Okay. So uh, my stepdad doesn't keep cattle himself. He leases it to a guy. Mm -hmm. And so intermittently, like one year they'll be out there, then they'll be out there for three years in a row, and then the next year they won't, and then they will. Like So sometimes there's cattle, but this time, no, there was no cattle out there. Okay. I know we're kind of jumping around and I do want to focus on, you know, as, as much as we can in That's order, good. but when those cattle were out there in hindsight, I don't know if you guys have spoken about this kind of stuff, you and your family at this point now, but were any of the cattle ever messed with or taken or calves or anything like that? Not that I'm aware of. Um, <clears throat> not that I'm aware of. And there's also a turkey barn within four or 500 yards of the house to the southeast. It's on the next property. Um, you have my stepdad's property line, and then that next property, there, there's a turkey barn. And when I've worked at a turkey barn when I was younger. Every day you walk through and you count the dead, and you take them out and you throw them in a pile. Mm -hmm. So my thought after all this, at the time, we, we thought this was a person. Never thought it was anything else other than a person. We just didn't know what he was doing there. But afterwards, thinking back, you know, I thought, well, maybe they're, they're coming and getting the dead and then coming over here for entertainment. Mm. I don't know. Uh, so <clears throat> what what would they do with the dead turkeys then? Would they ne the next day burn them or bury them or would they no, just leave them no. out? <clears throat> you got to think in a turkey barn, turkeys die every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, anywhere from one. It, I, it's rare to have a day where there's not one dead turkey. And I've pulled out as many as 18 in a day. So if you burn them, that's a lot of burning. Mm -hmm. Every day you're having to burn. So what they do, they have a burn pile, and they just throw the dead out there. Well, coons get them, whatever gets them. And if it gets bad enough, they'll burn it. But no, it, it, they don't normally burn their dead, or at least not the one I worked at. And how about the neighbors besides that turkey barn uh, and that property? How close are the neighbors? Um, so at the beginning of the road where our driveway meets the road, there's a couple houses there. And then like probably 50 yards down our driveway, there's a road to the left that goes around the northeast side of the house. And there's a couple houses over there. So, I mean, the closest house, is like it's not like it's out there by itself, but at the same time it is. It's away from all these other houses. Four or five hundred yards across the pasture is probably the closest one. Now going back to your very first sighting, which was definitely a striking sighting, I would say, because you can't really chalk that up to anything else. Um comparing that creature to now, I know you didn't see this one, and it might be a little difficult to to judge, but I'm going to try to ask it. Do you think that was the same individual as, as far as the height from you know the back of the house, and when you said your hand was up and where it was standing, <clears throat> where you heard the voice? Do you think that was the same individual? I don't know. That's that's hard. There was uh, there's another occasion where one spoke, and uh, this time someone that was else was there to hear it mm. it spoke three times in two locations and um you know i i've asked myself that is this the same guy i i don't know to, to be completely honest i don't know i thought in the beginning that possibly there was just one like in the beginning of me figuring out holy crap i think i know what this is after uh the deer hunt, but really, I don't, I don't know, Shannon, I think there's more than one out there, but I've never seen it again. Mm -hmm. I've seen Einstein again, uh, but I've never actually seen him again. So it, it could be, it very well could be the size and the voice that I heard absolutely could go together, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know. 
Now you said it, you've heard it speak again and someone was mm-hmm. with you. Were you in the house? Were you out in the woods? <laughs> yeah. So this was after I told my, my family about everything. Uh, there was some other stuff that happened in between this, but yeah, I, I was in the house. And who was the other person that heard this speech? Um, my mom. Okay. What did and, so? She, wa- walk me through that if you don't mind that whole situation. So after the gut pile got taken in the deer hunt, it after that like everything started coming together in my head. I went started researching, and I'm like, "This is what this is. This is what's going on." So of course, tell my family. Of course, they all think I'm crazy. But I'm a competitive, which I, I still shoot competitively, and I, I was a big hunter. Like, squirrel hunting, I did almost weekly. Like, it, it was, I loved it. It's my favorite game meet. Absolutely loved it. And I stopped doing all these things. And my family knew something was wrong. Um, they had experienced the banging on the house, the the night we all got up, I mean, they know that I would not do something like that just to, I don't know, just to make up a story. They mm-hmm. knew that night I was dead serious. I heard something. Um, so my mom, you know, they're torn between we know something's wrong with him because he doesn't act the same. He's, he, he's telling us he saw all this stuff. And so this night I'm, I'm in the kitchen so the kitchen and the garage there. So the garage is, uh, we're going to imagine each room is a perfect square, okay? Mm-hmm. So the garage is a square, and it has a window on both sides in, in the middle, on the left and the right. The kitchen square goes right on top of that, and then the living room square connects to the right side of the kitchen square, so it makes an L, okay? Mm-hmm. Well, in this L over here is a dark spot. It's pitch black because we have a light on the garage wall that shines straight out and a light on the back patio that shines straight out. But in this, it's pitch black. And this night, we didn't have either light on. It was hot. <clears throat> I got home. I had the garage door open, the door from that leads you into the kitchen. And I'm talking on the phone to my dad. He wanted some help with something the next day. He was explaining it. And I'm warming up a bowl of noodles and <clears throat> I know it's weird V8 juice noodles and hamburger is like my favorite meal uh, hey I'll have to try that that I'll, doesn't sound too bad <laughs> you have to love V8 juice or, <laughs> or else you won't like it but um we used to call it Aunt Wanda's goulash but anyways my Aunt Wanda made it so I've got these noodles in there and I'm warming them up and then I'm gonna add more V8 juice to it and do it again so put the noodles in and whenever I talk, I tend to pace. I, I, it's, if I'm in a car, I'll sit, but if I'm standing, Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll walk around and we have an Island in the middle of our kitchen. The door to the garage is on the back left corner. Okay. The microwave is on the top right corner and I'm doing laps around this as my noodles are warming up. Well, they warm up Ding, it goes off. I get them, and I kind of overheated them before I added the liquid. So, like, I'm upset because now i got mushy noodles. So mm-hmm. I dump the V8 juice in. I put the noodles back in there, turn them on, and I go back, still on the phone with my dad, and I'm walking around the corner. So I walk around the corner that's closest to the garage door there. As I go around it, I hear a man speak out in the garage. I thought it was my stepdad. So when you come in the garage, every night when he comes in, he slams the door behind him. So you always, you know, that's the precursor to him coming in the kitchen. Well, I didn't hear that. So I'm thinking he's on his phone and he's carrying stuff in from the car. So he didn't shut the door. That's why I didn't hear it. So it wasn't enough to make me stop and look out right then. But I, I complete the next lap and on the next lap, I step on in the doorway and I poke my head out, looking to the left, expecting to see him in front of his car. And as soon as my head gets through the doorway, this thing speaks again. And whatever it was, was on the outside of that window. Mm. I could not see it was pitch black, but 
as soon as it spoke, I dropped to the ground. It scared me because I felt it. It, I felt it was so deep. Like I, I felt it hit my face. So there was an immediate jerk reaction. I dropped to the ground in like a fetal position mm. and I took, made my hands into fists and kind of put them up by my temples. Like, mm. I guess when you're scared, you're naturally, you protect your head. Mm -hmm. And so, except in one hand, I've got my dad on the phone. So I step, poked my head out and it speaks and I immediately drop down and I stand up and I back up and I slam the door and I say, dad, I have to call you back. And I hang up the phone. My mom was putting my nephew in the back, which is right there. And I'm like, Mom, they're outside. Put him up and take him to the back. Or I said, it's outside. Mm. And she's like, what? You know, my nephew's running around naked. Like, he's he's happy. He's about to get <laughs> right. in the bathtub. And she's like, Dustin, you need to calm down. And I'm like, I shouldn't have done it, but I yelled. I was like, put him in the other bathroom now and go get the gun. Well, my pistol was on top of the fridge, so I already had it in my hand. She's like, come on, talking to my nephew. She's like, let's put you in the other bathroom. Mm -hmm. So she puts him in the other bath. I go get the other pistol, and I'm like, take this. And she's like, Dustin, you need to calm down. You know, like talking to me like I'm, I'm stupid, you know. I'm like, Mom, I heard something talk outside. And it was right there. And she's like, oh, what if it was, you know, your stepdad? So we go back in the kitchen in the refrigerator. We're standing on the far side, on the living room side of the refrigerator. You know, I'm putting the refrigerator between us and the door. Like the door is shut now that leads out to the garage. And we're standing there and I'm telling my mom, like what happened, what I heard. And she's really not, oh, it could be yada yada. And so in the doorway to the living room where we're standing straight back is the doorway to the patio and the doorway to the patio, the light wasn't on, but it has a big oval window in the center of it. And this thing speaks again mm. and it is back there and me and, and my mom goes, what was that? Who is that? And I grab her and we go to the other side of the fridge so oh it God. can't see us. And I'm like, I told you. She's like, who, who's out there? Who's out there? Like, she's serious now because <laughs> Dustin's saying all this crazy stuff. And now she hears it. Right. And so she's like, is that, you know, stepdad? I'm like, or my stepbrother. And I'm like, you better call him because if it is, they're about to get shot. So, of course, he was at his house. She calls my stepdad. He's in the middle of the grocery store. Oh, he drops his groceries in the middle of the store, jumps in his truck, and drives out there. Of course, when he gets there, he drives all around. Not a sign of anyone or anything. But my mom heard it. And the thing said the same thing all three times. Oh, my gosh. The first time it said it. And I thought it was my stepdad out there talking on his cell phone. When I poked my head out and it spoke, it said the same thing. And so in my head, I had, that was the third time it said the exact same thing. And so I'm like, Mom, what did you hear? And she's like, there's a man out there. And he, he, he spoke. And I'm like, Mom, no. How many syllables? What did it say? She goes, I don't know. I'm like, how many syllables? She goes, uh, two like, I have the answers in my head, but I'm wanting her to confirm without me telling her what I exactly right. what I heard. And I'm like, yes, what did they start with? And she's like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, what was the first letter, letter of each syllable? And she's like, D. And I'm like, yes, mm. it said the same thing all three times. And uh, was it the so same short, uh, short burst, like an exclamation, like you mentioned that very no. first situation? No completely different it was not exclaiming this time and it said okay so it was one of the two here either i'm gonna hold the microphone up so it either said drob drew or drob group mm. i'm not sure which one but shannon so this whole time i'm i lived in terror like after the gut pile and I realized what was going on, anytime I went to that house, 
I'd sit at the beginning of the driveway, the AR-15. Now, before the gut pile, I didn't. But after, once I figured out what was going on, and this occurred after that, after I had told my family, it was like I was ready for battle. I'd sit at the top of the driveway. I'd load the AR. I'd load my pistol. Whoever was with me had a loaded gun. And we drove down the driveway, and that was just to get into the house. Mm, gosh. So this, this, I thought that they were tormenting me. Now, looking back, maybe they weren't because of this one encounter. This one thing that it did, at the time, I thought it was a fear. Now, I've come to the conclusion, either they enjoyed scaring me because there's other things that they did and we can go into if you want, but that they, they saw my reaction. And so they did, did it again immediately, or it was trying to communicate because what it said, it said the first time was very short. The second time it was a little bit slower and louder. I mean, I felt it hit my face and the last time, it was like draw, drew, mm. like it, it was really enunciating. And like if I was trying to teach you a new word, right. I would slow down the word. But I don't know. I'm not saying that they want to be my friend. I still lean towards mate. I think they just like scaring the crap out of you. I, I don't know. But this one encounter, I tend to think maybe their behavior wasn't aggressive and I just took it that way, but I don't know. It, it surely, it felt aggressive most of the time, but same thing all three times and each time it said it a little bit slower. That is interesting though. It's a really good point you made. Like maybe it was trying to get you to understand really what it was saying or maybe it was saying, Hey, no, I'm, I'm cool. I'm just here to check you guys out. Of course, being that big, it'd be tough for the big guy to always be seen as uh you know, furry forest friend all the time. Yeah. Um, and I've had people email me and say, he was telling you his name or other people say, well, I speak Sasquatch. Oh, and well, yeah. he, he, he was saying, <laughs> he, he was saying, um, uh, food, mm. food. Like he wanted food. I mean, I've had people tell me, first of all, if you say you speak Sasquatch, you better have a lot of stuff to back that up yeah. because that's hard for me to swallow. I auto but, tune out when I hear somebody that claims that. Yeah, yeah I agree yeah, with that, you. That one's hard, but you know, there was a lot of other things that happened before this and kind of led up to it, especially the, the gut pile. Yeah. And it, I'm sorry to take you past that. I, I no, know I was fine. trying to go in, in sequential order and I screwed that one up, but I wanted to hear more about the voices oh, because I, that's fascinating. Cause I know the gut pile was like, uh, that was a big turning point for you. So we're definitely going to get to that. I just, I'm so stuck on the speech thing. Um, I'm it's, sure for you, it was amazing. It is, it is. I, I, I see, but here's the thing. Someone that says it was asking for food. I'm thinking, those things are bad to the bone, dude. They don't need to come and beg for food from people. So I don't think that it was asking yep. for food, um, first of all. And again, I'm not an expert, just like that person is, is saying they could speak Sasquatch, and I surely yeah. don't. But I don't think they need to come and ask for food from us. Um, what times of the year was this going on? Did things also happen in the wintertime, or is this the fall? They happen. All year, you know, wow. I, I guess you're getting to, you know, think on if they migrate. I personally do not. I think during deer season in the winter, I think they, they move out of the hunted areas and people say, you know, well, they go way in deep. They might. My personal opinion is I think they come to town and I think at night they come into town and they hit the dumpsters on the edge. That's just my personal opinion. Um, I, I could be wrong. I've seen evidence of it, and I, I talk about it on my show because I, I've talked to uh, probably five different people, and I think three of them I had on my show that all had their encounters within five miles mm. miles of this spot. Um, I, I think during deer season, it amps up, and, and they, they come in to – you know, get out of the way of the hunters, but it, I, this stuff happened all year round. 
Now, when we thought it was just a person, it, it's hard to remember exactly when a lot of that stuff happened because we weren't, I wasn't logging it, you know, in my right. brain. After I figured out, I have a little better, but it, it happened all year around. But it seemed to be around the deer season time that it really increased. And, and like the speech that night, where that thing was, so when we don't have any lights on in the house or the outside lights on, my stepdad never kept the outside lights on. Now, when I'm there, they are always on. And, you know, there's that window in the door. I take paper towels and I take magnets because it's a metal door. And the magnets, if you walk in the house, my mom has to explain it to people. And they're like, why do you have magnets on your door? Well, that's my son because he can't sit in here in fear of something looking through. You know, I pay, I take the paper towels and I hang them in front of the windows. At my house, I have black trash bags on every single window so nothing can see in. Mm. I think that night it was sitting in a dark zone. Even if the lights were on, that little area right there right. is pitch black. Right, it knew and right I where to stand. It was, it was sitting there watching me through the window. And when I was walking around, because we had the kitchen door open to the garage because it was hot in there when i was walking around i think it was seeing a glimpse of me as i was walking around talking to my dad walking around the island Mm. because the first time it spoke was when i went right in front of the door but i continued to lap around and i looked the second time I do the same thing when I'm on the phone. If I'm like for like right now while we're sitting and talking, I'm fine. I'm not like wanting to yeah. walk around. But right when you're in the house or whatever, you're pacing around. Maybe it was like looking at you like, what the hell is that guy doing? <laughs> right. Yeah, He's like I, trying to figure I, out I, why I, is he just walking around in a circle? I thought about the food thing, but it didn't see me. I mean, I where the microwave is, you know, you take it out and you put it on the closest flat surface to right. prepare it you would have been blocking the, the view right corner, you, yeah no it couldn't see me because mm-hmm. that's you know the door is at the bottom left corner of where the island's at and the mo- microwave is at the top right and the window he was at is on the right side of the garage so he could only see through the doorway and saw maybe the the kitchen table right. over there but right. there's no way he could see me preparing the food he could only see me pacing, talking with my dad. Now, I don't think I, when I mixed, after I poured the juice in and I mixed the noodles up before I put it back in, I don't think I walked around the island once. I'm pretty sure I just prepared it and stuck it back in the microwave and then started walking around. So I don't think he was asking for food. I don't think he was telling me his name. Like, he saw that it scared me, or it saw that it scared me because of, I mean, I dropped to the ground, put my fists up by the sides of my head, by my temple. Like, it knew, and it moved from there to the concrete patio around back and spoke through that doorway because there's a window. I think it knew, okay, he's shut the door. Now I'm going to go over here so I can see in. And where we were standing, he could see us perfectly, but we were looking at the other door because that's, the door, you know, that all this happened at. Of course, and if, so he if was he was looking behind us. Right. But if he visited a lot to where you didn't know, oh, yeah. um, he, he might have seen many a time someone getting something out of the microwave and actually turning around with that said food and then the table's yep. right there, right? So I guess that, I mean, it's not impossible. If he, the microwave he watching is you. in full view there. Right. As long as your back yeah. isn't right in front of it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's perpendicular to how that door sits. So in the doorway to go into the living room, it's not like right on the wall. You know, there's probably six or ten inches of wall there. And then you got the doorway in the fridge. So he can see a door open and people putting food in and taking right. out. Right. Like that's literally the perfect view because that's how you, you, you have to stand there. It's just there's so many things about that encounter. Each time it spoke, it saw me. The third time, it went to the back so it could see me, and it spoke, and Mm. it had to see my reaction and my mom that time that it scared us. So why would it do that unless it enjoyed it? 
or unless it was trying to tell, I don't know. It's just bizarre. And in language, it's not, not the chatter. I've never heard the chatter. I believe they do it. Never heard it. Ron Moorhead, when I listened to that, the speech, again, not the chatter, the speech, that is 100% the exact thing I heard. Now, not the same words and syllables, but that gave me, it still gives me chills when I listen to it. So that's what I heard the first time it spoke, and that's what I heard on that occasion. See, and it said the same thing three times, which would lead us to believe that it actually did mean something. It was trying to say a specific thing because it repeated it three times. And I like the fact that you're like, Mom, what did you hear exactly? Before I tell you what I heard and influence your answer, what did you hear? And she was spot on. If, if, if you know me as a, as a person, I'm very details because the devil is in the details. So I'm very thorough with things when I ask people stuff, you know, I guess people feel like I interrogate them, but I have to paint a picture. So like in that right. moment, I knew what it said and I wanted her to say what she said. So later she would remember it. And when I tell people, you know, there was, even though it was a high stress situation, there was still logic there. Or I was trying to use logic as best I could right. in that situation. At this point, is she going, oh, my God, like, that's not a person? Or is she, what's her thoughts at this point? So if you ask her, it sounded like my stepbrother. He has a real deep, gravelly voice, but she knows it wasn't him. Uh, she knows that there's no reason for anyone, like, the way the driveway is, if somebody drives down the driveway, you can see it. Like nobody comes down our driveway and we don't know about it. Um, she knows, and this is probably nine at night. I know the grocery store was still open and my stepdad was there. So it was, but it was dark. I was pitch black out. She knows that it was something. Um, we, we've talked about a couple times since and actually had someone come down. That's going to be doing a, um, a documentary or a web series. And the first time I'd heard her talk about it without like me being there. Um, she, she believes 100% what's going on. I think my mm. mom, in order to live there, she has to try to keep as much blissful ignorance as possible. So right. she tries not to think about it. But uh, before this, there's another night that, we were talking about this and, you know, she's questioning me, well, why hasn't, you know, my stepdad or her, his family ever seen it, which I couldn't answer back then, you know, and my thought now is you, you can't see what you're not looking for. And these things hide in plain sight. Mm -hmm. um, but <clears throat> and so we're talking about it and she's like, well, what do you think? You know, why would they come up there? I'm like, mom, I think they're watching that. They must be watching the house all the time. She's like, well, if they're watching it all the time, take me outside and show me one. I'm like, Mom, it doesn't <laughs> work that way. Right. She's like, well, according to you, it does. So I'm like, you know what? Fine. Grab my pistol, which has a light on it. Go outside knowing 100% I'm not going to see anything. But I, I'm like, oh, well, I'm sick of arguing about it. Let's go. Up. I click my light on, and we start shining it, and I start at the shops. And I started scanning to the right, and bam, something. Now, at the time, I didn't know what was going on. It, the eyes were about three to six inches above the grass, and the grass was a few feet high. I mean, it was tall, dead grass, mm -hmm. but they looked far away, And which later I figured out this thing was standing down the hauler with just its head poking up over the hill. Uh. So it was actually way behind the grass. But it looked like, because it was just above the grass, it was right there, but it looked farther. So I'm shining, and boom, we get these two eyes that are huge. There's no horses, no cattle over there. It's, it's the hauler. And I'm like, whoa, Mom, do you see that? And she's like, yeah, well, wait, what? And I'm like, do you see the blue eye shine? She goes, well, I see it, but it's not blue, it's green. I'm like, okay, mm. yes, but it's blue. 
she's like, well, no, it's green. And so we started arguing. And so I keep the flashlight still and I lean over and it changes colors. And I think it's just from the angle that you're seeing the light, Mm -hmm. you know, light, you know, in a wave, different wavelengths, uh, because of their, how thick they are, they bend in different degrees. Um, and I, so I think that's what it was. And so I'm like, Oh mom, here, lean this way. Is it blue now? And she's like, Oh yeah. And so we're staring at it and this thing is rock solid, not moving. My mom's like, is, is that a horse or I'm like, no, the eyes are too far apart and they're too big. She's like, well, is it an owl? I'm like, there's not a tree right there, but it's the eyes are too far apart. She's like, why isn't it moving? And so she does the one thing. She knows nothing about this, you know, but at, I knew what she was doing. She was trying to get it to move, but she goes, whoop, <laughs> just like that. And I'm like, mom, what oh, are boy. you doing? <laughs> and She's like, well, it's not moving. I'm trying to get it to move. Well, then it starts the first time it looks over to the right and looks back at us. Oh, boy. And she's like, oh, look, it looked. Now, when it turned and looked back, its eye shine was white. And it stayed white the whole time. So I hmm. don't know if it, it stood up higher or if it repositioned and right. we were getting a different angle. But it started looking to the right and back at us. To the right and back at us. And then it progressed into a frantic like looking right looking back looking right looking like it started Mm. getting frantic and and now it didn't bob or weave like the other one but when it would turn you could see this thing had a flat face Mm. these eyes were not on a deer when a deer turns its head you can only see one eye when you could see one eye you could see both and you could see 100 percent on a flat face and so it starts you know, jerking its head really quick. And me and my mom were like, uh, do you want to go in? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's go in. Well, so we went in. Now, do you think it was like signaling another one or checking to see where it's, it's mate was? Or I, I think it was either just, okay. Looking for a escape plan. Okay. This is where I'm going to dip out. Mm-hmm. But I tend to think that's not it because where it was, You know, if the top of the hill is at one point, it was probably 30 yards behind that, you know, so it's not like it was laying on the ground, poking its head over. Right, it's not in the open. I mean, the only place Mm. it could have done this was, unless it was, nothing could have been hovering there because it couldn't have moved the way it was moving. And I would have seen the, the bouncing, you know, if it was an owl just flapping in the same place. But it was standing down the hill, so all it had to do was duck down and it could have went left it could have went right it could have went forward it could have went backwards mm. we would have never seen it so i tend to think it was looking at another one and either checking to see what that one was moving or if it was i don't know it was i don't know the way it was looking was very intelligent it's like it was figuring out i don't i don't know because all i had to do was duck down and we couldn't have seen it it was in the most strategic position it could have been in on that side. And the wood line, you know, over to the right there is where that semi-trailer is, where it was looking. And just the wood line is just probably 30 yards across the fence right there. And that's where it was looking. So I tend to think there was another one, and it was just, I don't know, locating where, where that one was so they could coordinate. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't blame uh, your mom's like, uh, want to go in now? Like, yeah, yeah, let's just go in and watch some uh, baseball or something. Um, yeah, honestly, it it may have been me that said that. <laughs> I don't blame um, either one of you. Wrong, <laughs> but we both agreed. I don't remember who said it first, but we both were ready because it went from rock solid to not moving. And this was several minutes we stared at this wow. thing. And, and, you know, people think, well, why didn't you get your cell phone out? We didn't think about it. This is, my mom is still buying into this herself, you know? Right. It's not like, oh, we know they're here. It's, it, the thought never came up. But when it was frantically looking, we're like, yeah, it's time to go. Because it's, something might something happen, going you know? On. It's yeah. very nervous now. Can I just say that I wasn't, 
I wasn't expecting these to be so recent, and we're going to swing back to the gut pile uh, after this, but uh, you mentioned there's a web series going out there or whatever. If they need just a mic person or something, have them give me a call because I would love to see a Bigfoot. I cannot believe all the stuff that you guys have going on out there. I wasn't, when you said 2014, I'm like, holy cow. You know, I you hear a lot of stories and sometimes they're 10, 20, you know, plus years old, whatever. So this is a, wow. I'm i I'm still definitely processing. So I can only imagine your mother just trying to get through, uh, you know, just the day-to-day stuff of living out there. Holy smokes. Okay. So well, Dustin, she, oh, go ahead. She, yep. No, you go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say whenever you want to, you know, kind of go to the, the coup de gras moment for you with that gut pile being, uh, Ixnade, you you go for it. No, what what were you going to say though about your mom? Um, she keeps it in the back of her mind. You know, she said to me several times, "I just want to see one and get it over with." And mm-hmm. I'm like, "You don't, because you won't want to live here." Yeah. And well, then you won't be able to so, just be like, "Oh, it's just the wind, or just yeah, uh, the cat, exactly. or the dog, or whatever." Yeah. My stepdad will never leave that property if he has to. So he'd kill every one of these things. Like, he grew up here. This is his family's. He won't leave. And if my mom saw one, uh, they have a very, very good relationship. But I think that would cause a problem because right. my mom wouldn't want to live there. and My stepdad won't leave, you know. Yeah, right. right. <clears throat> but it's uh, back to the, the, the mic thing. Carrie, who came down, he had an amazing encounter. I had him on my show saw one of these things turkey hunting 25 feet it yelled at him it talked at him mm. it it was crazy that's what got him started but he came down and when he shot the episode i've talked to him i mean we're friends we we talk there for a while several times a week and he's like dust you know when you tell these he's like i think your episode people are going to realize the gravity of all this because when you talk about where these things happen, like, I naturally picture, like, the gut pile encounter that I'm about to tell you about. He's like, you know, you always say how close it was, but I still picture it's in a field mm-hmm. or it's in the woods. And he's like, this is right there. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no way. And, you know, it's it's hard to picture, but, you know, Carrie's going to be posting those, I think, at the beginning of the year. But I, I hope people will watch them because then you see – you know, that gut pile encounter, I was faced with something that I could no longer keep tucked away. Um, it, it was, I think most people that have encounters with these things, they're able to tuck it away and never speak about it. And they're happy. And I get that. I wish I could go back to that because when you're forced to face it and recognize it as a, a reality, your life changes mm-hmm. and it sucks because you can't, this may be a bad way to put it, but I always say I was raped of my innocence of the woods. It was stolen from me and I, I cannot go out at night in, in the city. I can't walk to my car without fear. You know, I can't, I used to think I'm, I'm a competitive shooter, big time hunter I thought I was the biggest, baddest thing out in the woods. And when you learn you're not, you, I don't know. It, it changes your life forever. And a lot of the changes are, are negative. And, I, you know, I'm working on, on being able to go back out in the woods and hunt. And I'm taking baby steps. But it's, <laughs> if you see this property, you'll understand why why all this is so crazy and so believable because it's, you know, these things happen right there. I can say, I honestly believe I've been within 15 foot of a big foot of whatever spoke those two times. You know, I'm right there that that night it was on the other side of the wall. They're ballsy. They'll come right up, you know, but at the same time, it's like, why don't they just rip the door off right. and come in the house? Why don't they just, you know, it. I I don't know. Sorry, I went on. A no, no. Oh, oh, you know, I love tangents. That's no problem. So for you to hear me say, and I know you've heard me say before, how much I want to see a Bigfoot. I I mean, I can 110% say that I, I want to. If I could fly somewhere today 
and spend, a, you know, a three days a week. I don't care if I have to sleep in a tent. I wouldn't want to see one. But for you, who's been through all of this, to hear me say that, uh, you know, how do you, I mean, do you get that or do you kind of go, oh, you need no, to be careful I, what you wish for? I 100% because I was the same way. I used to watch Finding Bigfoot. You know, I thought that there was the possibility of one of Bigfoot being alive. His name was Bigfoot, and he mm-hmm. lived in Northern California. Right. <laughs> and, you know, I wanted to see one. And I think it comes down to civilization plays a big part of that and our quote-unquote reality. Because I, I, I totally understand what you're saying, but... In, in your thought process, it's, it's a lot like going to a zoo. I want to see it. I want to start the encounter, and I want to end the encounter. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm standing, and I look at this massive grizzly bear, this massive lion. I know it can't, you know, come after me. It can't get me. I, I'm safe. I look at it. It's so beautiful. I would love to see it. I love looking at it. But when you are in their, their environment, and you see one, it's like being dropped in the cage with the lion. Right. It's no longer beautiful. You're at its mercy. If it wants to kill you, you're dead. If it wants to give you a high five, it's going to, I mean, you have no choice. And so I think when people have the urge to see these things, I totally understand. And, you know, I'm like, oh, you're so dumb for thinking that. I get it. But the realization is these things are wild animals, and other than our, our technology, our firearms, that's the only way you're outsmarting it. That's the only way I could win. But when you're standing next to one and you know that it is one, even after seeing it, it's still hard for me to grasp that these things are out there at this house where my nephew plays. And it's scary because there's no control. You have no control of the situation. So, so that's my opinion on it. So, but when you were when you still go out to that property to visit or whatever, you you still go armed. I mean, you you still do, hold, do the whole hey, I'm ready for battle just in case, right? Do you do you sleep there anymore? I mean, what's uh, what's your feelings on the property right now today? Um. So if if you were to call my mom right now and ask, it is. When I go out there, I don't sleep. I can't sleep. It's, uh, I cannot sleep. I cannot feel peace. And, you know, in starting my show, I called it crypto PTSD. You know, most people think you can only get PTSD from wars, uh, car accidents, rape victims, anything tragic, you can get it. And I'm not saying that I had it and I never went to, uh, a, a, counselor, therapist, doctor, and been, you know, diagnosed with it. Never have I done that. But I went through sleeping in the bathroom, curled around my gun, because mm. it's the only place I felt safe. Um, and I'm not going to go into to it, but there's the property, they're still out there. I, I don't think that they, they want to hurt us, but when I go back there, it's it, it, I might as well be in the middle of a war because I'm ready for it at all times. Mm. Any noise that's heard, I have to figure out what it is. Nothing can look in at me. I cannot have any windows open. I mean, it's the paper towels on the back where it, it, it's funny, but I still can't sleep. Now, normally what happens is I stay up until about five in the morning and then I fall asleep. Because either my stepdad gets up and I feel safe because someone else is up, or I don't know what it is, but absolutely the property, I don't think it'll ever go away. I don't think that, that feeling will ever go away. And what about your nephew? Has he heard or experienced anything? Is he scared out there at all? We keep him sheltered from it. Mm-hmm. Um, he knows what I, I think he has found my show uh, because he's told me. I love your intro. Oh. And I'm like, you're like, ah, you're like what? <laughs> you little turd. <laughs> but he, he's not allowed to listen to it. Yeah. He asked someone one day, because he's like, you know, Uncle Dustin, I I asked his, his babysitter, mm-hmm. and she said that these things aren't real. And I'm like, she's right. She's right, but it's just a show. Right. And 
I, just so everyone knows, that is not what I believe. I want to keep them sheltered, mm-hmm. but I always tell them, I, I say, Jace, if you're ever outside and you're playing hide to go see, you know, there's predators out there. There's things out there that can get you. And my mom, of course, there's this, this ongoing thing. I don't think she's cautious enough. You know, I don't want, if they go in and he forgets his backpack in the car, she'll let him run out and get it. Mm-hmm. And that to me, you know, so it's, we've had a lot of arguments and because my mom said, you know, I, I shouldn't have to change my life. And I'm like, well, you don't, there's a few things that you could change that are very simple that don't change your life to keep him safe. And I'm like, mom, you heard the voice, you know, I'm not making this up. You know, this is true. And just from them seeing me, they know I've seen something. Some of my family members, it's so hard for them to grasp, but they, they've seen the proof in, in the giving up hunting and the, the other things that, that have gone on. And, you know, I think, sorry, I'm getting way off. Here. No, I'm no, no, that's Shannon. okay. No, it's um, fine. And in fact, I wanted to ask you, you know, your thoughts on the other people that still do go out hunting and heaven forbid they're by themselves. That's a hunting one one No, no. But, do you think that in some cases Bigfoot is responsible for some of these missing people and kids? 100%. In the, after I figured out what was going on, going on, I thought the activity was based around my nephew. Mm. But I learned, because they, they did something else, and we, we can go into all that, in the, the deer hunt. I'm sorry to your listeners. I, but um, it's absolutely... I, I think just like humans, just like dogs, there's there's buttholes in this world, mm-hmm. and then there's big people. And I think that these things have short tempers. Um, I do think that they, I believe 100% they have a language. I believe I've heard it. I believe they're very intelligent. I do not think they're more intelligent than human beings. I think they're better than their environment than human beings. I think that they're their abilities, I think their athleticism is off the charts, charts, and it's hard for us to comprehend the things that they can achieve um, because they're they're just built for it. And do you think but, that's why sometimes they get that paranormal tag uh, attached to it, like the way that you said yours ducked down, you know, so smoothly, where you know if if someone's of a paranormal mind, they might go, "Well, it's paranormal." I mean, it just like disappeared; it, it just sunk into the ground, right? You know, I, I thought about that a lot. I don't think that it's connected. Do I believe in the paranormal? 1,000%. I've seen things. I know it's real. But I don't, you know, people, I've seen people that go out in the woods that have never been out in the woods in their life. Maybe they go deer hunting every year. And they think that they're this great, you know, even me, I used to think I'm the I'm the best hunter in the world. You know, I think everyone who goes out in the woods thinks, oh, well, I know what's going on out here. But most people don't because they, they either sit in a deer stand a quarter mile from their vehicle and they think they're a great hunter, you know, mm-hmm. and they do that every year. You know, people who actually spend time out in the woods every day, they're, the knowledge that they have is just amazing. And I think that there's, there's paranormal activity in the woods in some areas. And I think people like to blur the lines because if Sasquatch was, was paranormal, why does he do such physical things? Why has he learned to strategically hide down the hauler to where his eyes are poking just above the top? So if he needs to, he can just duck. You know, why wouldn't he, if he, if he could shape shift or, or go through portals, why does he live in a bush? Right. Why does he, right. you know, why does he, the activity, his behavior that we hear time and time again, why has he adapted and, and created that? There's no point if you can do these things. Do we hear of, of ghosts strategically hiding themselves like that? You know, no. Yeah, they're, they're they very, things right in front of you. Yeah, they're very tactical in a lot of the things that they do to the point where it, it becomes creepy and scary because they're so good at it. But, um, yeah, no, and not that I was saying that I, that I think or that you think they're paranormal, but I just, I think that sometimes 
when you hear a story, someone says, oh, it just disappeared up the side of a hill. It didn't disappear. It's just so badass that it ran up that hill with such a quickness that we cannot grasp that because there's no way we could do that. So they're like, oh, well, I don't know. I don't know if that's a real, you know, flesh and blood creature because it can do blah, blah, blah. So, um, okay, swinging back really quick and then we'll get to the rest of, of your uh, tale here. Back to the 411 stuff. Uh, you know, taking the, the kids or the people... What do you think they're doing with these people and with these kids when they take them? What is the purpose? I don't, I don't think Bigfoot accounts for all that um, because there there's some impossible things. But are there cases in there that I do believe Bigfoot is responsible for? Like like that little boy and the people saw that that hairy man carrying something over his mm-hmm. shoulder. Um, absolutely in. You know, I, I have people contact me, and they these things like little girls. I'm sorry. I don't believe. Now, do I think that a Bigfoot has made contact with a human sometime throughout history and became friends? Sure. Absolutely. Special circumstances, special people, special Bigfoot, it could happen. But I think for the most part, their distrust for us masters all of their behavior and when it comes to liking little kids or little girls i'm sorry but i think there's only one of two uh or one of three possibilities uh sexual in nature hunger to feed to eat them or just a curiosity but if it was just that then why if i see a new animal for the first time and I'm like oh my gosh look at that it's so fascinating I'm gonna sit and watch but I won't sit and watch once a week every day for five years right what happens when you I get won't. tired of it that's obsessive behavior and so to me that's a different kind of motive um I think some of these creatures are bad I think when they go through puberty the young males and they hit puberty you know, Thriller and Michael Jackson, you know, he uses the werewolf. That song he wrote about puberty. Um, if you actually look into it, that's why, mm-hmm. that's why he used the werewolf to demonstrate the transformation. You know, I think these things, if, if an animal, if a mare or horse is in heat and it's two young men that smell that, I, I think that there's one thing on their mind. I've heard encounters. And I, I've got one guy that knows someone that that happened. Now, of course, the second hand store is always hard. Plus, I've heard it on other shows. But these things go after animals in a sexual way. Um, I, I think it, it's one of those three things, Shannon. Fascination, but fascination turns into an obsession if it's longer than a, a month or several months. Mm. Um, so it's. After that, it's sexual or it's it's to eat them. I don't yeah. think that they're doing it because they're like, I want that little girl to be my friend. Yeah, please I don't think just that that's it. Let, let's go with the eat me option and just get it over with, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's pretty terrifying. Um, and I completely agree with you. I think there's some cases in there that mm, it could be just very mundane things up to just crazy people other crazy people in the woods and that's why everyone should take a gun by the way i don't care how upset it makes people if you go in the woods without a gun it's not smart i'm sorry uh bigfoot and then the other high strange cases like you mentioned which cannot be classified which are also fascinating so yeah i completely agree with you on that so okay well let's jump into this uh the gut pile story and this is what prompted you then to finally kind of let it all out to your family right yeah, this was, um, and a, as you guys will hear, it was so obvious and in my face and so impossible for any to explain it in any other way that this is, I, I couldn't tuck it away, I guess. And someone was with me throughout the whole thing, experienced the whole thing, had him on my show, he's my cousin, um, you know, I, I've had other family members on my show to talk about, you know, honestly, what they think about me and this. And a lot of them have ended up having experiences. But 
in this, I'm going to be very detailed. Obviously, I'm long-winded, but I like the small details because, to me, they paint that perfect picture. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be kind of gruesome, so I'm going to talk about gutting a deer. So just pre-warn everyone. My cousin and I, this was the following deer season. We, we decided to go hunting, okay? So I had 30-06, and it was like an hour before dark already. So we go in, we, we were over at his house. I don't remember what we were at. We get to the house. We are throwing our clothes on. Of course, my mom wants to take pictures. My nephew threw his clothes on. He didn't go with us, but my cousin's new to hunting. He had went, but he, he never went on his own or anything. So we get dressed and we start walking outside and we're going down that path to go to the east field to go to the woods on the east side of the house now almost all the activity has been on the other side of the house over where this basically happened at so we're walking and i'm talking to him you know about about you know you need to look for this or you know horizontal lines and movement that's what you need to keep your eyes whatever and we're walking and he's like hey dustin is do they have horses in that field and I'm like, what? And I look up, and there's a buck running across the field. So I'm like, no. Pull up. I shoot the deer. I, I shot him. He ran up to the fence and did what we call getting drunk because I, I hit him in the back of the heart, but I just got the back of it. Did the mule kick, ran up to the fence, started getting drunk, stood back up, jumped the fence, and he starts running to the hauler on the west side of the house. I didn't want to have to drag them out, end up shooting them again right there. Me and Jordan grab them, and we drag him over to our yard, which is just right there. Go and get my family, my stepdad, my mom. That's the biggest buck taken on that property, and my nephew. We were literally hunting for less than two minutes, okay? <laughs> we just got out of the door. Oh, yeah. um, I wasn't even really paying attention yet. Come out, take pictures, you know, it's getting dark. And I asked my stepdad, hey, where do you want me to gut this? He said, take it to the back corner in the fence. Like, okay, that's right behind the semi-trailer, okay? That's that back corner, and there's a four or five wire barbed wire fence and a gate around this you know, on all sides, okay? And it's a little box. That's where he's got his cars and stuff back there. So we drag it back there. I cut them open, pull the guts out and the guts are clean. Guts do not have blood on them inside your body. That's a misconception because of Hollywood. They're clean unless you shoot something and they get blood on them. Pull the guts out. Well, the diaphragm separates the heart and lungs from the rest of it and the esophagus. So, I knew that was going to be full blood because I knew I got them in the heart. So I pulled the guts out, set it there, cut that. And of course the chest cavity is completely full of blood. There was a perfect half circle on the back of his heart where I hit him mm. on the first shot. <clears throat> so I pulled the heart and lungs out. The heart's my favorite part. And I know it sounds gross, but don't knock it till you tried it. And I, I wanted to take that in. I wanted to get a sharper knife, and it was getting dark. So I wanted to pull our vehicles down so I could finish what I was doing. I flipped the deer over right next to the pile of guts to drain all the blood out of the chest cavity. Take the heart. Me and Jordan walk inside. Uh, I believe I filled up a bowl, salt water, put that in it. Uh, stuck in the fridge, grabbed another knife, grabbed my keys, took my truck and his car. We pulled down there, and when we walked out, I shut the gate behind us because I was like, I know nobody's going to come down and steal my deer because this is the biggest buck of my life. Like, no, I know nobody's going to come steal it, but just in case. I remember that, and so does Jordan. Shut the gate behind us, um, went in, got the stuff, so we got our keys, we're back in our cars, He's like, do you just want to take your truck? I'm like, no, pull your car down too. So he gets in his car, I get in my truck, drive to the gate, open the gate. We pull through him and we point, uh, our cars pointed to the corner. Our cars are on the path. Well, there's a dip right there 
on the edge of the path where it leads to the tall grass where the deer is. So we get back. First thing I do, we get out. We just grab the deer by his horns because the light's not hitting it. And we drag it over to the light where we had our vehicles pointed. So I'm over there and I'm splitting his pelvis, getting him ready to be hung because I'm going to take him to my uncle's to hang him. And I cut a piece off of him, hand it to my cousin, and I'm like, hey, go throw this in the gut pile. Um, he walks over there, and I, so I'm trying to – he started – rigor mortis started to set in, so the deer is starting to stiffen. So when I'm trying to cut through the pelvis here, the leg is flopping over, and I can't hold both legs. I'm trying to step on one and hold the other with my arm and do this. And so it's frustrating me, and I notice Jordan is just standing there. I'm like, hey, dude, what are you doing? You want to take that home with you? It, it was the male part of the deer. So mm-hmm. like, you, you want to take that home with you? And he's like, Dustin, where's the gut pile? And I'm like, thinking in my head, this moron. Mm-hmm. How yeah. in the world? Because this is tall. It, it's dead yellow grass. And you know how in, in the wintertime the grass kind of folds over on itself so it's not that thick or tall right. but it's all yellow and blood or guts sticks out like a, a light on dead yellow grass red and dead yellow it, it just sticks so i'm like jordan it's right there just throw it down and come help me and he's still standing there holding this and i'm like dude or he's like dusted it's gone and i'm like what and so I get up and I'm, I'm literally frustrated because I'm like, it's the big pile of guts that's laying right over there. How do you not see it? There's a huge pile of blood next to it. <laughs> Walk over and you can see where the gut pile was, where the blood had run up against it. The blood puddle had run up against it and was running around the gut pile. So now that the gut pile was gone, it was the puddle was in on almost a full crescent moon shape, but it was filling in that crescent moon part where it had run up against it. You could see that absolutely nothing was there. And he's like, Dustin, what could do that? And I'm like, dude, I, 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 I don't know. Just, just help me load this in the back of my truck and let's go. And he's like, Dustin, what did that? Like, he's trying to, I'm like, it it was nothing. Like, I don't want to freak him out. And at the time, I didn't want to think. So we loaded it up. I went and hung it up. Then I came back, and I got a mag light. And I stood there, shined the light down, because it's pitch black. And I'm like, okay, if something, first of all, coyotes, they rip things to pieces. That's the only way they can eat. They have to eat with their mouth. So they have to shred it and rip it to pieces. Uh, mountain lions, no way they could have carried it off. They would have had to. And it's the same thing. It, it could have drug it off. We don't have black bear in this area. There's been like one black bear sighting. It was like 50 years ago. I've never seen any black bear. So like I'm thinking, okay, for something to do this, it's going to have to drag it to the fence. Because there's a fence on all four sides of this. You're going to have to drag it to the fence and then cross the fence and then pull it underneath. And I'm like, that's where I'm going to find where whatever took this. Still not thinking Bigfoot. I get back, shine the light down. I walk in a circle and I take one step out. Walk in a circle, one step out. That way I'm not missing anything because yellow grass and red blood stick out like a sore thumb. I I did it all the way. I crossed the fence and went 10 yards, 20 yards past the fence. All the way around, Shannon. There was not a single drop of blood, Mm -hmm. a single piece of organ, a single drag mark. Because if me and you, Shannon, were like, hey, let's steal this, we would still be dragging pieces behind us unless we had a wheelbarrow. But then I would see it because we couldn't put it all in at once because there's different pieces. The large intestine, low intestine, the tongue, the stomach, the liver, the gallbladder. I mean, there's a bunch of pieces. You can't just pick it all up at once. Even as a person, nothing, if a, a deer or a predator 
there was no, we were gone less than 10 minutes. I mean, there's no way we were gone for 10 minutes, but I say that to be safe. This thing, whatever took it, had to have been watching us, knew we left, came and got it, and there was absolutely, Shannon, not a single scrap of evidence anywhere. And I tend to think I'm a, I'm a, at least a smart enough guy that I can figure things out using common sense and logic. There was nothing. And talking about it now with my cousin, he remembers I didn't want the deer to go down in the hauler. That's why I shot it again, because I didn't want to drag it up. But I also just didn't want it to go in those woods. And he, I remember when I was telling, talking to him as we were walking up, he wasn't listening. He kept looking over the, to the woods. Mm. And looking back, he's like, Dustin, I had a feeling like I was going to see something over there. He's mm-hmm. like, it wasn't necessarily fear. I just had a weird feeling. So after this, we didn't talk about it. To me, everything came rushing back. Probably three months later, I, I, I went back to St. Louis, uh, d- started looking online, trying to figure out, listening to podcasts. And I found out, you know, Bigfoot tend to do this. Went back, decided to tell my family. Him and his mom were the first people I told. I was kind of, I guess, testing the waters. And he was like, dude, there's no way. They don't exist. Sorry. Um, they, they aren't out there. And I was like, we talked for like 15 minutes discussing it. And finally, I'm like, do you remember the gut pile? And mm. he stops. And he turns around and he goes, holy crap. Because he had forgotten about it because we never spoke about it. After I'm like, dude, it it was nothing. It it was coyotes. And he kept asking when we left, we never spoke about that again until I brought that back up. The other, yeah, um, I I like the fact that you did, you did your sweep. You know, you're looking for even just one piece of something because as you said, these are all separate organs. And not only that, but aren't they really quite slippery? Yeah, and they had blood on one side of them. Mm-hmm. I mean, naturally, like like the liver, if you grab it with your bare hands, like it, it's naturally slippery. But there's, you know, most people think there's blood all over inside. Well, the second time I shot it, I hit him in the shoulder, so it exited out his neck. So there, the diaphragm was intact. The diaphragm is a uh, uh, connective tissue that separates heart, lungs, and esophagus from the rest of your gut. So even though the chest cavity was full of blood, the diaphragm was intact, so no blood leaked. But when I tipped the buck over, you could see where the puddle had run up and was going around the the gut pot. Mm-hmm. And it was on grass. The grass was mashed down there from us, you know, stepping and dragging the deer. So it wasn't a perfect, like if I dumped it on concrete, but you could still see where the, so it had blood all on one side. It's slippery. If me and, and you wanted to steal, first of all, people would have stolen my bus. It was literally laying right next to the gut pile. We would have stolen the bus. People don't want those. The only thing you might eat out of that is the liver. I don't like it, so I don't eat it. There's no way me and you could carry that off without dragging bits behind us unless we had a wheelbarrow right. or a vehicle. And I shut the gate, and we would have seen somebody come down the driveway. We would have heard them, and they would not have time to get it done. And, the, and being gone for less than 10 minutes, that counts walking to the house and walking back. Like, it, I, it was probably closer to five. It is impossible that anything else, an animal, would have either tried to consume it there. If it did, it would have knocked the blood puddle. You know, it wouldn't be a perfect shape. It would have drugged stuff around. And if it wanted to leave with it, it had to drag it. And it had to get it over the fence or under the fence. And that, like, there was, it was 100% impossible for any other explanation. And that is when everything came rushing back oh. and it I, I go ahead I'm sorry uh, I have a question uh, about that too 
And I completely agree. I don't know what else could do that. Do you think, though, that, and considering the fact that the first one that you saw, well, really the only one that you saw, right, was nine feet tall, estimated, I don't know that it would need another buddy to come up, and I can imagine him no. kind of uh, kneeling, right, and picking up the pieces, and if he's got this massive chest and these huge arms, he could probably just... You know, either scoop it all up at once, like, you know, uh, bringing it in from the outside and into the middle and then drawing it in. Or maybe he did, you know, big old hand and just, okay, there's the liver, here's this, and then here's the intestines, and then off he goes, right, with it all against his chest. Do you think that he would need a, a sidekick for that job? Or do you think if that was, let's just assume no. it was the big guy that did it? No. So my my thought when I think about this, was always, okay, if he carried it, how did he do it? Because I believe he did it by himself. Because when you were to carry something, just like they would carry something, blood would be dripping. And Shannon, there was not a drop anywhere. So I thought about this a lot. If you take a marble cutting board, okay, a marble one, and you dump a liquid on it, it runs straight down and goes straight off, right? Mm-hmm. If you take that same marble and you place a piece of carpet on it and you dump a liquid on it, it's going to run off, but it's going to take time because right. it's going to fill in and be soaked up. So the only thing I can think is that this thing carried it with its arms and leaned back so that the blood would hit its own hair and it wouldn't drip off for at least a little bit until he got time to get get out of the yellow grass and into the hauler right there right. where the wood start. That's the only thing I could think. I think if two of them would have carried it, they couldn't have done it without that blood that run up to the gut pile and was on it would have dripped off. So I think he used his hair to keep it from dripping long enough to get to where I wouldn't be able to find. Because once you get even 15 Steps out, how I did it, I did it like circles on a bullseye. A circle around, a step out, a big step out. A circle around, a big step out. When you get even 15 steps out, you're covering a pretty big area. And I did more than that. And so he had to have, had to have made it into the wood line because I didn't go into the wood line. Uh, Dustin, what color was the big guy that you saw? Could you tell? He had to have been black. Oh. Um the thing that's bothered me, and I'm guessing the only reason I could put it in the back of my mind, is I didn't see his face. I didn't see any details other than his eyes, shape of his head, and his outline. Like, when I have nightmares about it, the Bigfoot's face is always different because I never saw any details. Like, I should have been able to see more because he was not, I had my high beams on, and he was not that far away. Like far, no, I mean, he was within a hundred yards for sure, probably somewhere between forty and sixty yards away, and so he he was black. I'm guessing, black or brown. I, no, I would say he was black. The first one was a glint of brown. It seemed like a different color. The uh, what caught my attention when I saw something dart across the path and that glint of red eye shine mm -hmm. that's what got me to stop that was brown but it was thick and it was low and how it moved was weird because deer when they trot their front end and their rear end bounce kind of separately mm -hmm. they're not like mule deers that bounce all at once you know so their front end and back end and this thing just when it was low but it was thick too um yeah, I, I think it was black. I just, I was, I was imagining, you know, and I, that, that makes sense too. He would lean back and then everything gets soaked into his hair, less evidence to leave behind. I'm just, I, I'm imagining him being, if he was, or if this one was, maybe it's not the same one that you saw, could be, very well could be, but if it's a brown or a lighter color, can you imagine seeing that thing the next day? And it's just covered Ooh. in blood. I mean, that oh, would, you'd be done. You'd just be completely done. And you, because you wouldn't know. I mean, if it was a separate person, uh, heaven forbid. But if even if you just saw that the next day, you'd be like, oh my God. I mean, 
I don't know how cleanly I, they are, right? If they if they bathe every day or what their deal is, but I cannot imagine uh, seeing one of those. Plus, it just smooched and dried blood. I I would think that they would have to eventually clean themselves. But that's funny that you say that because I've thought about that. I'm like, you know, if I ever hear an encounter with somebody's like, I saw this thing and it had blood all over it. Right. Like, I know, oh, you know, try to pin down the same day because uh-huh. absolutely that is what I think it did because that's the only way if I was going to do it and I, I put myself in its shoes that I would be able to do that. Um, but that, that would just be in the smell. Mm. Could you imagine if it didn't clean itself for days? And another thing I thought about is the trying to do it again, making the guts bloody, and then the next day go out in the woods because it's going to have to leave sign. It's eventually going to drip blood. And that is going to be against little, the brush that sweeps across its chest. It's going to have blood. It's going to drip blood on the ground. I, I've thought a lot about that. It, I'm happy you brought that up because absolutely that thing had to be covered in, I mean, because it was soaking around it. So that means right. the, the blood puddle was hitting the gun pile. It had to have had blood all over it. I mean, they were clean when I pulled them out. I didn't pay attention after that, but it, it had to have had a good amount of blood on it. Just so incredible to think about them being able to execute that. And I have no doubt that they can. Um, he's like, well, this looks delicious. Yeah, and you guys were definitely being watched. So I guess the shot goes yeah. off. And I think they, they hang around close, like you said. But that was really the dinner bell that you guys rung with the, yeah. the shots. I I thought, well, maybe because the deer was running in that direction. I'm like, maybe. Mm. It had to have already been down in that hollow right. watching us. So I'm like, maybe it was waiting on that and it was mad that I got it. Um, because the second time it spoke was after this. The first time was before this. That was after this. So I thought, well, maybe I ruined its hunt. Maybe um. it took that as a tribute of me being like, here, you get this. But then other hunters do it. So why would it? I think. It was smart enough to know I need to leave the deer because if not, this guy and the other guy with the gun, because Jordan was carrying a gun too, they're both going to come looking for it, you know? Because yeah. we, I brought my nephew out, sat him on it. We took photos right there before we drug it back there. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. you could tell if they're intelligent, like I believe they are. I was proud of it. I brought my family out. You know, we all touched it. We all looked at it. They went in. So I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I've thought a lot about it. I, I can't decide exactly why I think it took it. Maybe then, and for everybody, I know we jumped around with the sequential order of things, and I apologize for that. That's my fault. But the, as you said, when it spoke the three times, it it got slower each time, and I, I would guess at this point, this is when the people that say they can sp- speak Sasquatch would say that it was not saying drop Drew, it was saying thank you. Thank you. There you go. We figured it out. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, those same people Thanks for the gut pile. tell me that these things speak, what, speak our language, and I don't believe that, because if it did, it would have said something to me a long time ago. Right. You know, both times, it's I don't think it was trying to say English, but failed. I think it was speaking its own language, and I couldn't understand, but it's similar to how we form our, our words and sentences. Right. We just haven't caught on yet. Can't get yeah. around them long uh, enough to figure it out. Yeah. I mean, observing them when they don't know, so their natural behavior, those encounters I always find the most fascinating because they're so rare. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I'm happy that they're rare because I feel like if everybody started to say they were experiencing this, I'd be like, oh, okay, this is really going to muddy the waters, guys. And if you notice, you know, these things are hard to sneak up on. I know, I do believe people who say that that's what happened, but most of those encounters where they witness natural behavior, um, unadulterated by the human being there, it's they went in to hunt 
or they they walked into an area and they sat down and fell asleep and then they woke up and it it was walking through or it was in the valley or normally it's people who have been in the been sitting in the same spot for a while and haven't been moving you know because i i think whenever you i think that just speaks to if you want to attempt to do that walking up and sneaking up on them is mm. almost impossible but sitting in a place that you know they frequent and waiting on them to come back i think that's about the only way to achieve that yeah and most of those encounters or something to that sort. I had a guy on my show that as a kid went swimming and they swam out to this island and they fell asleep. And then they woke up because their mules were going crazy and they looked and this thing was on the shoreline going through their stuff and mm. never knew that they were on the island watching them. Oh, God. Was the thought then that they were already on the island or that they swam across like the people did? No. The, the two kids were playing, went there to go fishing, weren't catching nothing. It was about midday. You know, they had uh, rode the patch and mules several miles to get to this spot, and they used to play on this island. And so they swam out there and decided, well, we're, we're tired. So they laid down and they fell asleep. And then they woke up because their mules back on the shoreline were kicking and bringing, and they... Oh. they we're in tall grass, and so they turn around, and they peeked above the grass, and things going through their tackle box. Gotcha. Yeah, I've heard I've heard stories of them swimming, and for some reason, it really just it creeps me out to think of them just swimming. You know, when I remember a story a long time ago on Sasquatch Chronicles, where a guy was in a I think Will Jevening was talking about it, and he said that a guy was like in a canoe or something in a boat or. And at a river, and it was a decently deep river, I believe, and he saw the Sasquatch just, you know, swimming under the water like uh, Michael, what's his name? Just like he... Michael <laughs> Phelps. Like a, yeah, Michael Phelps just owning the water. I'm like, there's something really creepy about that. I, I Like, you, there's just nowhere you can go to kind of be, quote-unquote, safe from them, right? Um, Dustin, what about on the property itself? Any physical sign that you've ever come across, like footprints, scat, or any odd <laughs> hair, or anything? Yeah, uh, well, tree breaks that, and that's that's been about it. But uh, the very first time, you know, after I went in looking into this, and I told my family, I'm like, you know what? If these things, it, they're here, so they have to leave sign according to the internet. So. I walk out to the woods that's over in the east field. I'm walking down the path, and the first thing I see is this tree of a branch that would normally go across the path. It is snapped backwards, and it has a rotten log that did not grow there, did not fall there, laid on the top, pinning it down to the ground. Mm. And that's the first thing I saw. Of course, there's been many other uh, things like that. Um, hair, no, footprints, no, not there on that property, not that I recall. No, I have photos of some that I found, but it's a different area. Yeah, I was just wondering about that, and I know that they're very cognizant, and I think the gut pile story is the best example of that. They're very cognizant of what they leave behind, unless they do, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, um... Again, thank you so much for coming on. Let's plug your show one more time. Oh, besides the YouTube and the iTunes for Crypto PTSD, are you present on Facebook or Twitter or anything like that? Um, I I don't have a group set up yet. I plan to set one up. I'm still a, a small show, but uh, we're growing, and I've got, I think, 30 episodes. Nice. Um, and, uh, no, right now it's just – I'm – group members i'm sorry shan i'm a member of a lot of i'm a member of a lot of bigfoot groups uh so you can find me on there talking to people and i always answer on the comments in my videos but uh the best place to find me is there or um if you have an encounter or something my my email i give it out every episode do you want to give it out here or just let them uh, listen sure. in on youtube yeah. Uh, crypto PTSD at gmail.com, C R Y P T O PTSD, 
all lowercase, no spacing at gmail.com. And I do everything. Dog man, uh, probably 90% of my videos are Bigfoot. The dog man, Bigfoot, paranormal, UFO. I've got UFO encounters. Um, I do just about anything. So if you've had an encounter, send me an email and uh, I'll get back with you. That's awesome. And I, I will encourage you to definitely get that Facebook group going. It's a great way just to, you know, get people talking and excited about the show. And it is a slow process. Even Mine's been a very slow process, so don't get uh, discouraged. You just kind of have to keep <laughs> plugging away. As long as you enjoy it, then, you know, it doesn't seem like work at all. So it's still fun, and I still love doing it too. So, yeah, the Facebook group is a great way to also get more encounters coming into you. I will make sure to link all of that in the uh in the show notes dustin so um man thank you so much for going through all of that uh it cannot be easy to talk about I, I even when i talk about my quick little encounter i still get the clammy hands and stuff so i can't imagine having to go through all of that again so <laughs> i i thank you very much well shannon thank you for having me on the show and and let me talk about all this i I, I know I'm long-winded, but I like to be detailed. I've had more encounters, so if you, if you ever want to have me back on, you just let me know, and, and we'll get together. Yeah, I think we will have to do that. Thanks, Dustin. Thank you, Shannon. Well, I'm so-and-so. I was given this name by my parents. I've been to such and such a college. I've done these things in my profession. I produce a little bar. The Buddha says, forget it. There's nothing that's some story. That's all gone. That's all past.